My name is Josh Getzko. I'm a senior lecturer at the Hebrew University and have no conflicts. Expanding the EUA to children is unnecessary, premature, and will do more harm than good. Slide two. There is no emergency for children, especially healthy ones whose risk of severe illness or death is almost nil. Kids with pre-existing conditions and prior COVID infections were not included in Pfizer's study, so including them in the EUA is negligence. Slide three. Correction, the 2268 number is for all subjects. Pfizer's trial is woefully underpowered to detect specific space safety concerns, such as myocarditis, just like the adolescent study was. And if they weren't able to detect an unexpected safety concern there, they wouldn't be able to here. In Pfizer's study, only 0.5% of controls were dropped due to important protocol violations versus 3% in the treatment group. The odds of that happening by chance are 1 in 10,000. This deviation is poorly explained with no IPT analysis. The study is not double-blind and may be subject to biases. Most VSD safety monitoring programs have not reported results. Why not wait? Slide four. From CDC reports, we can expect that for every 18 child hospitalizations prevented, at least 43 will end up in the hospital for all causes following vaccination. FDA's risk-benefit analysis only counts myocardi myocarditis hospitalization. Why ignore the vSAFE data? And shouldn't FDA verify Pfizer's efficacy and immunobridging analyses first? Slide 5. Theirs shows alarming safety signals, which we have shown cannot be attributed to increased vaccinations, stimulated reporting, or COVID infections. Slide 6. We calculated the ratio of adverse events reported per million Pfizer vaccinations to reports per million flu vaccinations among teenagers to see what to expect in children. Serious events are reported 61 times more often for Pfizer, deaths 47 times, and life-threatening conditions 49 times. Slide 7. Here are the Pfizer flu reporting ratios for some adverse event categories. Look at the box on the left. What are we doing to their reproductive organs? How can you expect young children to take these risks to protect adults? Look at myocardial disorders on the right and ask yourself why Pfizer's briefing document didn't mention their child substudy on troponin levels. You should demand to see those results. Slide 8. There are over 900 types of adverse events reported in teens from Pfizer vaccination that have never been reported for flu vaccines including 11 cases of MISC with no COVID infection, and that's before correcting for underreporting. If you were hoping to prevent MISC, it's time to reconsider. Slide 9. The fact is your approval today means mandates tomorrow for healthy children who don't need it and for those who weren't studied. If you have even the slightest doubt about safety, you must vote against forcing these and unknown long-term risks on young children. So in the name of millions of parents around the world, I implore you, hold the line. You won't be able to say you didn't know. Next speaker is Luke Yamaguchi. Hello, my name is Luke Yamaguchi. I have no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. From March through October of last year, children 5 to 14 years old had a 1 in a million chance of dying with COVID-19 in the United States. For perspective, children in this age group were about 10 times more likely to die from suicide than from COVID-19. A recent article in the New York Times cited data showing that unvaccinated 5 to 11-year-old children are actually at less risk of hospitalization from COVID-19 than fully vaccinated older adults. For children 5 to 11 years old, the weekly rate of COVID-19-associated hospitalization has ranged from zero to a peak of 1.1 1 .1 per 100,000 population. Regarding herd immunity, the state of Vermont, despite having the highest COVID-19 vaccination rate in the country, is currently experiencing the highest number of active COVID-19 cases they have ever had throughout any point in the pandemic. Similarly, the country of Singapore, with 84% of their population fully vaccinated, is now experiencing their largest wave of COVID-19 cases and deaths since the beginning of the pandemic. With this in mind, I want to mention three factors that must be taken into account when making a risk-benefit analysis for COVID-19 vaccines in low-risk pediatric populations. The first point I want to make is that pediatric hospitalization rates are inflated by the detection of mild or asymptomatic infection due to universal COVID-19 testing procedures in hospitals. One study out of Stanford found that 45% of pediatric COVID-19 hospital admissions were not caused by SARS-CoV-2 infection, and so this must be accounted for in your risk-benefit analysis. 
Additionally, the risks of recommending COVID-19 vaccines to children who already have natural immunity against COVID must be taken into account. Current estimates would suggest that almost 50% of children have now recovered from COVID-19 and acquired natural immunity. The research is abundantly clear now that natural immunity to COVID-19 is vastly superior to vaccine-induced immunity because COVID-19 vaccine-induced immunity rapidly wanes over time and requires future booster doses, each of which carry their own risk. Furthermore, there is an additional risk with vaccinating people who have previously had COVID-19. Data out of the UK shows that prior COVID-19 infection is associated with increased risk of adverse events from Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine, with in young individuals more likely to report adverse events. So for about half the children in the United States who have likely already acquired natural immunity, the risks of COVID-19 vaccination almost certainly outweigh any possible benefit. And this needs to be accounted for in your risk-benefit analysis. The last thing I'll say is that it's possible that people who get a COVID-19 vaccine will need to get another booster dose every six months, potentially for the rest of their life. And with every additional booster dose, there will be the risk of myocarditis, along with the risk of other adverse events. You can't just look at a six-month risk-benefit analysis and say that it's all good. You have to look at the long-term risks versus benefits, taking into consideration that natural immunity is broad, robust, and long-lasting, and vaccine-induced immunity is not. And so I urge the community to exercise the precautionary, precautionary principle and withhold the EUA of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for children 5 to 11 years of age. Thank you very much for your time and consideration.